Hello, everybody. So we will start our last uh, panel conversation, uh, Evolving European Legislation Within the Apparel and Fashion Markets, substanti Substantiation of Environmental Claims, uh, which has been co-organized by TUV Rheinland, just on time. Uh, so <laughs> let me Sorry. introduce our speakers. We are with Anguen Alexander, Riza Balaban, Stefan Popescu and Florian Devigne. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself. Um, you can start, Anne Gwen. And um, you have the slide. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much to have invited me for this round table. And uh, thank you, TUV. Um, I am a French uh, lawyer uh, based in Nantes. And um, um, I dedicate my work for uh, textile and uh, fashion industry. Um, I, I, uh, I've got a certification in uh, ESG, environmental, social and governance, and uh, I'm really dealing with um, all of issues regarding econo um, circular economy or due diligence for uh, the sector. Also, um, at the national level, I belong to some uh, association like Fashion Green Hub and also the Fédération de la Mode Circulaire, which are two associations working for sustainable development in the uh, textile and fashion sector. And um, also, what can I add is that um, I also sometimes uh, write articles on the subject and also um, uh, intervene as the lecturer at the IFTH, Institut Français du Textile et de l'Habillement, and also um, I give courses at SMOD, which is a fashion school, um, uh, every time on the subject regarding uh, ESG issues. Thank you. Uh, Louisa, we know you already. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Louisa Balaban. I am the Western Europe Sustainability Manager at TUV Rhineland. Um, my background is uh, consulting, so I've worked in consulting for uh, circular economy, recyclability, um, and textiles um, as well. Um, so sustainability is, is my focus. Um, my latest sort of experience was working on the Textiles 2030 initiative with, uh, with, with a UK-based NGO uh, called RAP. Uh, but now um, I've recently joined TUV um, and uh, we're basically uh, really expanding that sustainability strategy and the sustainability offering um, for our clients uh, in terms of certification, but, uh, but also holistic um, sustainability offering. Thank you. Stefan? Hi, everyone. I'm Stefan, the CEO of COS361. Uh, my background is more working uh, in brands, French brands, uh, in sustainability. And now um, COS361 is a consulting company. Uh, we are working toward eco-designing, uh, impact projects, uh, and also circularity. Our mission is really to accelerate uh, the emergence of a fashion at the service of ecological and uh, human well-being. So that's also uh, what we try to do on a daily basis. And um, for this uh, roundtable, we also quite invest into some more um, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, approach, like the PFCR. So we'll discuss a little bit about this regarding the environmental footprint as well on durability, alongside with the EFTH as well, uh, also with the traceability with the French uh, uh, fashion uh, industries uh, representative federations. Thank you, Florian. Hi everyone, I'm Florian. Um, I'm the CSI and quality manager uh, to NAFNAF. -NAF. Uh, I work in all these subjects uh, about uh, this topic. Uh, for NAFNAF in Paris, uh, NAFNAF the French brand. Uh, so I'm here to share my important view uh, about all this. Okay, so uh, let's start our uh, round table. Um, my first question for you is, uh, what are the challenges that the new laws and regulations uh, that govern the fashion business are focusing on? Uh, maybe Luisa. Yes, so um, obviously there is a lot of European, US um, and other Nordic countries regulation 
um, coming into play. Um, some legislative trains have departed two years ago. Some are also um, in progress. Um, but looking at 2030, I am very positive and very hopeful that a lot of regulation will be um, sort of uh, happening and enacted in the European space. Um, obviously, this is coming from a perspective of trying to um, avoid and succeeding to avoid greenwashing. And the European Commission, alongside with the European Parliament, is really um, tackling that and, uh, and going into that survey of the European market as well as consumers um, and, and youth being a, a really important driver of that. So obviously that's where we are at. Um, to you, Virainland, as an independent third-party certifier and provider of, of certification is really happy to hear that. And we definitely want to align on, on that uh, angle. Okay, um, anyone else? Uh, so we have some slides behind and you can... Yes, so... Uh, yes, it, it is working. Um, so obviously in the European Union we have 53% of green claims um, as inaccurate, uh, misleading or unfounded information. Um, and 40% uh, of environmental claims have no substantiation. Um, in the UK, we have legislation that's actually looking at, uh, at tackling this, which is enacted. Um, and there are over 230 sustainability labels and 100 green energy labels in the European space. So this is um, very broad and obviously the European Commission and Union are trying to really narrow that down, obviously, because it's really, really hard to keep a track of or the consumer gets very confused at the end of the day. So, yeah, that's, um, that's the, the main idea around the challenge of, of that. So you would like to add something? Um, yes, maybe with the other slide, with the timeline. Ah, okay. Yeah, if, if we look at this slide, we can already see that uh, we've got at least uh, six uh, uh, very important legislation uh, and the oh, yeah yeah um, right now since 2020 we can see that many legislations are either already adopted or um, in course or in discussion in the parliament. And what is important to see in this timeline is that um, the different legis European legislation or, um, which are under discussion uh, are regarding uh, um, the supply chain from the eco-conception until the end of the product. So, you've got some legislation regarding the eco-conception of the product, also regarding the production of di the different items, uh, textile items. Uh, also, you've got some legislation regarding the responsibility of the producer. Also, another legislation regarding um, uh, the reporting of uh, um, the companies which are dealing with suppliers and um, su the, the reporting that uh, they, they have to do uh, regarding the traceability of the products. And also, of course, and Luisa uh, told it a little bit uh, before, you've got a quite very important legislation which is named Green, green Claims um, and which is about the communication and the marketing of the product because now um, we, we, um, we face a very, very um, important uh, time in where um, the communication is not aligned with the product itself. So today, I, I will not, um, uh, you can read on the slide, but uh, 
we can see that uh, um, all of this legislation at the European level are dealing with one aim, which is the alignment between uh, the production of uh, uh, textile or fashion product and the alignment with the business itself uh, of the companies. Yes, so I guess uh, in, in terms of that, um, actually, I'm not sure if we can uh, at any point perhaps move back. Yeah, so basically, in terms of the green claims legislation, which is super important for manufacturers present here at the show, obviously you have um, on your stands um, GRS certified or organic cotton certified products, and you want to substantiate that. And the way to substantiate that is through third party certification. Um, but that's exactly the same trend that we see with, with the European Commission um, and they want to be able to unify that uh, methodology for carbon removal. Um, they, they want to, to promote through the uh, Corporate Sustainable uh, Reporting Directive that transparency um, and to look at uh, unfair commercial practices as well um, as contributing to, um, to to specific uh, chemical uh, management strategies. We were on the panel earlier talking about digital chemical management. It's also within um, legislation and coming into force. So I guess that's, that's um, super important. How do we see that in general? Well, maybe just to add a point uh, regarding the challenges. So just to clarify, um, the, the brands will have to, to show more or less, uh, to substantiate their, their claims. And Europe, as well as France, you will come to it later, are start setting the rules how to do it. Uh, of course, this has a direct, uh, indirect impact uh, with uh, suppliers as well, because you are, that's your customers. So you are engaged with them in proving, and, and maybe you will touch upon this uh, later on. So that's very important because these regulations are moving quite fast, are demanding a lot of things, trustability first, you have to know what's in your product, where it's coming from, and you have to prove it by third party, not by yourself or by your suppliers. It's not enough. Uh, you have also to engage into uh, measuring your footprint. This will come later also as well. Environmental impact, not only carbon footprint, so much more uh, complicated than this. Uh, and you have also to report. So in terms of uh, reporting, like uh, sustainability and uh, uh, financial reporting are now more and more important because after uh, the, the European um, Union and also the government, national governments will ask you for uh, proofs and maybe allow you or not to do business. So um, in the other slide, we, we spoke also on a, a big piece of uh, legislation, the ESPR that will come in force mostly for us in 2026. And in this one, you can't uh, import goods in Europe if you don't comply with the, let's say, eco-design requirements. That's very key. It's not like before, where you were having a fine if you don't comply with the regulation. That's quite new. Same effect as we saw in the US with the U Uigo Act. So for those of you suppliers that work in the US, you saw the changes. For my Chinese friends working with US, you saw the dramatic uh, degrowth of uh, your imports into China, divided by two in less than two years. So in Europe, it's in 2026. That's very important for every brands and suppliers because we, we work as a united and worldwide uh, value chain. That's important for you to understand what it's at scale, what does it speak about, and how to comply with, and how to prove it. I insist on the proof as well. OK, um, yes. Maybe we can uh, speak about France. Do you want to speak yeah, about sure. uh, oh. Yeah, that would be great because we we see that we have different level of uh, regulation, and in France recently we have seen a very important uh, new law. So maybe you can introduce them to our mm -hmm. audience. Yeah, actually, um, what is quite new in France is that uh, we've got the law. The law what we call AGEC, uh, the anti-waste and uh, recycling uh, law, uh, which, which was adopted in 2020. And um, um, we had to wait for the decrease. Uh, and the decrease um, uh, started this year, the first, uh, the first of uh, January 2003. 
And this law is very important because right now, um, some words in terms of communication are quite uh, forbidden. Like you can see here, biodegradable, environmental, environmentally friendly, and any other equivalent environmental claim is forbidden. Of course, we can see that what is very vague is this term, any other equivalent environmental claim. It means that there, is, um, there will be um, much uh, uh, interpretation that can be hidden between these terms. And right now, when um, you make some um, advert or you make communication on your textile products, you have to pay attention not to use these terms and to, um, to prove that what you are saying is aligned with what the product is made. Um, also, what is very important and which is um, a little bit in parallel with this uh, law uh, AGEC is the, um, um, the law regarding carbon neutrality because the same. Now it's uh, forbidden to use some uh, um, terms like carbon neutral um, and also any equivalent terms. So this is the same uh, meaning and the same deduction that we can make. That um, now some terms are forbidden, we need to know about them uh, and uh, we, uh, we need to pay attention to how the communication and how the marketing is made. Um, what is very important and can be found on the internet is that uh, last month um, there was a new guide, um, uh, a practical guide which was um, um, communicated on the internet and at the French level you can use this guide to, for your uh, adverts and communication. And of course it follows uh, what, is, uh, um, what are the rules in France. Oh, yeah, I had the, um, the, the second question. Um, can you introduce the main recent European regulations and directives because it's the main uh, frame, European uh, frame uh, that we are focusing on today? So you have already um, answered more or less the question. Yeah, touch, touch. Uh, but would you highlight some uh, of the regulation that have been uh, released recently? Uh, just to remind you, but I think you're aware about it, that the directive has first to be um, uh, implement in, uh, and adopt in each country before, be, while the regulation has to be uh, adopted uh, in all the, the European, um, uh, the countries of the European Union. Um, would you come back on the regulation from the European Union? Yes, Alice, of course. Um, uh, it's true, it's very important to remind uh, every all of us that um, when a directive is adopted at the European level, maybe after there will be one or two or three years because this directive is transposed into the national laws. So even if, for example, you've got a directive uh, adopted today, maybe uh, this directive will be transposed into the German law within one or two years and so it will be affected it should be yeah, effective in one or two years. Um, the focus that we can uh, make at this point is um, that, on my point of view, there are very two big uh, directives which are very important. We, we, one is about the green claims. Yeah. Um, it was a directive... Which actually in the UK it's fully enacted. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this one is very important, and it's true that some countries are already uh, leaders on, uh, on, th on these uh, topics uh, uh, included in that, in that directive. Um, green claims are regarding communication and marketing and um, adverts of products. Uh, so which one is very important? Um, uh, it was made in 2003. 
And the other one is the, the one regarding the due diligence. Due diligence means that uh, there will have um, there will there, there is the will to um, tra trace and um, to trace all of the suppliers and uh, to also be transparent about uh, the products. So this one is very important because it means that for your suppliers, maybe you will be asked to give some uh, information about uh, your products. And um, it's not something uh, um, that we know, we need to know all about you, but it's because there will, there, there will be um, um, uh, a will to know and um, uh, how can I say that? Um, um, to, to disclose information, yeah, to kind of find yeah. out more about the supply chain, yeah. We, we were looking um, at updates about the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive and um, it really is, first of all, it's addressing um, disclosure about your supply chain in terms of a lot of different things, but the, um, it's also quite regular, so you have to disclose this every year and you have to get that information about your supply chain every year and um, you have to also have the right mechanisms in place to uh, be able to um, function or change suppliers in case certain internal um, regulations don't align, so you have to have your own way of implementing that in your company. And this is really looking at uh, public and private companies. Uh, so, um, what about your experience uh, at uh, NAFNAF? -NAF? Um, have you already worked uh, on those uh, regulation and directive internally? Uh, yes, of course. And um, like uh, Louisa and uh, Anne Gwen say, the most important things is uh, sorry is um, the the information that that uh, we need to have. And um, f this information came from the, the supplier, so it's difficult for the brand like NAFNAF -NAF, uh, to explain um, to the supplier why we, we need uh, all this information to explain uh, the French or uh, the European regulation. Um, so. It's really like in school to explain uh, why and uh, that's it. So you have a huge uh, work to uh, inform uh, your suppliers and you have to work on the, you have to educate your suppliers exactly, about yes. it? Okay. Yes, exactly, and um, um, the final, um, I The, the final. Um, <laughs> you can say it in French, yeah. and uh, we have a translator. Uh, so. The final, the final objective. Yes, yeah, the final objective uh, is to respect all this regulation for the brand, and um, it's not a problem to do this for the brand, but it's complicated to have all this information and to work with the supplier. So it's very important that the supplier uh, understand all these subjects and uh, work uh, in partnership with the brand. Yes, uh, and I guess it's even uh, more complicated when you are working with uh, suppliers in a, a another country where the regulation, the, the law are different. Yes, of course, and um, this is a very important uh, topic, yes, because, um, for example, I don't know if, uh, if a brand works with, uh, I don't know, uh, Romania or East Spain, for example, it is in Europe, so they understand all this, but, for example, I don't know, in China or in India, uh, there is very news uh, for, for the supplier, so it's complicated. 
and we don't have a practical uh, guide on this as well. So it's laws, so everyone can access to it, everyone can read it. And as you work with these countries, you are by to, to know it. Uh, nobody has to, fin, everybody has to know the law. <laughs> That's key for the legislation and for the one that will control you as well. You can't say, I was not aware. You, you work with France or other co European countries, you have to know the law, whether you are a brand or a supplier. So then after, but still the law doesn't give you a clue regarding the uh, practical uh, uh, way of being. So how do you put all these demands in a practical way? And it's a short time, uh, moreover. So it's difficult for all the ecosystem, brands, retailers, uh, as well as uh, suppliers, to keep up the trace. And no legislation is giving you the how. They give you the where they want to do, the what they want you to do, but not the how to do it. So then it comes back to us. Uh, and that's how it's key to have collaboration with your suppliers in order to understand, to educate uh, both of, th of, th of the brands and the suppliers, and then face it. But for sure, don't wait for regulations or for national bodies to give you the how. That's not their job. Uh, they don't know how you work. Uh, they just do politics and regulations. So they won't come back to to help you more or less. That's why it's a step-by-step -step approach, but very, very practical, and that's how it gets more difficult, more or less, uh, to, yeah, to comply with. Uh, among the, the reason why um, it, it is so important for all uh, the, the, the partners involved in the supply chain to, to be aware about the new uh, regulations, uh, there is this question of the digital passport. We, you have certainly heard about it. Um, and I would like to, to clarify where we are because we can't ask people to provide a digital passport, right? And don't explain how they can do it. Yes, we can, I will say. <laughs> uh, and Europe will be, uh, will do this. So more or less the digital it's product happening. passport. <laughs> yes, it's happening. So the digital product passport, is, it's an easy concept. Each of you here has a passport. Wherever you go in this world, you will have to come to the customs and show your passport, where you have your ID, so all your information, who you are, your countries, and so on. We want the exa exact uh, functionings with uh, products. But when they come into European soil, they have to prove some uh, other requirements that I said earlier, the eco-design requirements. What's an eco-design requirements? Well, it's not clear here again. Uh, what about your uh, environmental footprint? About your uh, percentage of recycled materials? About your traceability, uh, where it's been produced? About a uh, lot of things uh, about this. And this passport will be uh, a way to a carrier, a data carrier, more or less, to uh, have a change with different stakeholders. So first, customs. Again, <laughs> to be clear. Customs will do the job uh, and will stop or not your goods in Europe. Second, uh, your customers, the brand. They will ask you for information and so on. Third, the real consumers, so the end consumers, every European citizen. Fourth, the end users, recyclers, collectors, and so on that will need it. So all the data you have to provide has to comply with all these stakeholders and the data carrier, the digital product passport, will have to make sure that you can uh, buy, uh, that your information are easy to exchange. So Europe will give us more or less the framework, global framework. What do I want in terms of eco-design? I want your environmental footprint and then you have to manage how you do it. And how they want it, so it will give us the global framework of the DPP uh, but then in details, well, it's up to us to do it. That's what we are also pushing uh, in France and in Europe to gather together as one industry, work together. What does it mean? Because nobody except us professionals know how to do the job. So let's come together, decide how to do it, and then provide it to European Commission for them to decide in practical ways, does it comply or not with what they do? But they will never go past the, let's say, the red line about the, the technicity and the complexity of our industry. That's not what they are looking for. They don't care really about this. They will care about global pictures and regulation and they will force us if we don't comply with it. Yes, uh, Anne-Gwen, you want to add something? 
Um, maybe we can uh, give some examples about uh, green claims? Obviously, we have this public space in which retailers, retail manufacturers make and we consume and all that. Everyone has a right to talk about what's happening. That's the, the role of the NGO and the role of, uh, of the public as well and the role of the Consumer Market Authority, which is fully fulfilling that role in the UK, um, actually challenging these brands. Um, the point is not uh, necessarily to look at specific um, specific brands, um, we, we understand that's a, a work in progress, but we just want to go there and substantiate those claims uh, when they're made. Uh, and we think that that's the most important um, area. So obviously durability, end of life, uh, testing for design for disassembly and all of that uh, can be, uh, and perhaps we can move over um, a, lit a little bit in terms of um, and further. So, oh, sorry. Just about going through that. Okay, on this. Yeah, no, I will do it then. Yeah, just quickly. Um, this is what we do uh, when we are uh, working with our customers regarding the what we call the adaptation cycle, and that only my only advice I would like to share with you uh, regarding first step. If you want to uh, comply with this. Every journey, uh, uh, you have first to go uh, into empowerment. This is key to understand what we are speaking about. So train yourself, train your teams, train your suppliers as well, because you're working together. First step, uh, very important before going into this. Then, uh, and train also uh, the full um, people in line with uh, the product in your company. So designers, produ uh, product offers, but as well as the marketing. Also, also yeah, your customers, yes. which are obviously going to come back with complaints yeah. about yeah. certain things and, and requirements. Yeah. Yeah. So really it's important to, to encompass this all at once so they understand what's at stake and they work as one. That's the key uh, also learnings I had uh, previously. Then uh, going to the watch, as you saw, uh, that's important that uh, everybody keep up with the laws, uh, the regulatory watch, so either internally, if you can, or externally, but or with federations and so on, but you have to be uh, on a constant watch. Uh, that's more or less compulsory now. Uh, that's important. Then uh, go for testing. Uh, you have to test. Like we said, there is no miracle recipe. So go step by step, but go for it and quickly, as fast as you can. Don't wait for the regulation to come in. We spoke about 2026. I know we are used in this ecosystem to speak about three months for three weeks collections. Well, uh, in order to do the job, uh, you need to be prepared and it takes, it takes much more than a year to get prepared, much more. So start today uh, and go for testing. Start f uh, uh, first to start by traceability. Uh, you do nothing uh, in all these regulations if you don't have the smallest idea of your traceability on your value chain. So that's my advice. Start by the traceability, to still very uh, trustworthy, and then go uh, for environmental impact calculation. That will be the next big one coming very shortly, uh, at least in France. And then it, once you test, then you can scale up. Then you can improve uh, and be open uh, with your stakeholders, your engagement, your commitment, where you want to do. If you have the right uh, understanding on how to calculate, to measure your footprint and so on, then you can engage yourself and go for improving, which is decreasing more or less, uh, your, imprint, your footprint. Sorry. And at, that's the last point. Then at, once you did all this, then you can start, for me, to communicate. That's what we do on the other way around so today. But first, yeah. do your job, do your homework, and then you can start to communicate much more easily with your stakeholders, with the regulation, and you can start to be really transparent. And don't forget, from day one, whether you are a brand or a supplier, you are accountable yes. for. That's very important to understand yeah. now more and more uh, on several level uh, for fines, for penal sanctions as well, for mm -hmm. some of the top management we have today, you can be penally responsible. That's a hard one. And also in terms of business with the SPR uh, within 2026, that would be very a, a blocker. Sophie, I, if I understand well, uh, you mean when you say communicate, is there, it's more communicating about the reality of where you are as a brand, as a subcontractor, what you know, what you are doing, uh, rather than communicate on the 5% you do that are uh, highly uh, green, uh, exactly. highly respectful, right? That's why we say, uh, I, I um, put communicate, not market. That's a different word. Communication, not marketing. 
that's another topic. You can market on the on your goods, of course, uh, what they are good, uh, nice, and so on, what you are good at. But then for all the SG more or less part of it, so sustainability don't don't do marketing. Okay. Just communicate. It's not about so it. intuitive for brands, I guess, because you are like when you are doing something you are proud proud of, you automatically want to communicate on it to s to make it work and grow, right? So how do you solve this issue at NAFNAF? -NAF? Uh, so for... Ah, so, diapo. Ah. Le diapo. so for uh, ADAPT to, um, for French brand, for example, the first one, yes. Uh, so for ADAPT, uh, brands need to um, work on different topics. So first of all, we speak about it, but have the information, have the data. So work with the supplier, for example, or other uh, company. Um, secondly, uh, work of all the um, IT solution. Um, for example, uh, your uh, system, because to adapt to, um, to uh, to collect uh, all this information in our system. Uh, and before this, uh, like uh, Stefan said, to communicate to all the customers uh, on your website, on the label, for example. Um, and um, to uh, solve a pro problem we, we have to um, to um, have this information. For example, in NAFNAF, uh, we start to work with um, a traceability uh, solution um, and uh, to, um, uh, to, um, to work with a supplier, they can um, uh, put all the data in this solution and NAFNAF uh, can uh, collect it before and share with all the customers. Um, and for the brands, the most difficult things for me, uh, it is to um, work on all the supply chains uh, because before the brands work only, uh, work only on the final product and that's it. They don't have the information of uh, fabrics or other things before. Uh, or they don't work to uh, the final uh, life of the product. For example, I don't know uh, how to watch uh, the, um, the, the product or anything like this. Um, and now the brand um, must uh, work on all these subjects, all these topics. And Thank you. And more, yeah. Yes, Riza? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was just saying, now brands need to work all across the value chain, basically. That's what we find. And also the value chain needs to really work across with the brands and suppliers, so it's yeah. a a real collaboration. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, I was just going to basically uh, quickly introduce you to how TUV Rhineland um, basically works across the supply chain and works across the value chain. So we are headquartered in Germany, but we are pretty much international and we work across different industries. Um, one of them is sustainable consumption. That's where our textiles and apparel area is basically um, developed. And we, we can see that, so the, the role of, of a third party independent provider is that we can certify that supply chain or that specific claim or that specific um, certification like an organic or a recycled um, and can safeguard everyone in the room the consumer, um, obviously the supplier, the brand, very important, um, from um, anything from fraud to just misleading uh, by accident. So um, 
we see that there is a lot of direction towards European-owned uh, environmental labels, like the EU Eco Label and the Blue, um, sorry, the um, all the other like Nordic Swan and uh, and Blue Angel, um, and we we're really interested to see more um, sort of um, updates from the European legislation in terms of where this is going to go. Um, because we, we, we are ourselves um, in that sort of phase of understanding where this is moving. Um, and as I said earlier, um, chemical management as well is a very important part of that. And uh, we're basically um, also offering very complex supplier engagement programs across the, the supply chain with input management of uh, ZDHC aligned MRSL level, levels um, one to three uh, to, to actual supplier engagement and output management and wastewater testing. Um, but beyond that, we obviously offer certification across all of the standards behind me. So um, everything to do with ZDHC accreditation, um, Sustainable Apparel Coalition certification, so we are accredited for that, um, as well as our own um, green mark, which is a um, specific uh, green product labeling, uh, which looks at four different um, topics, so environmental, social, um, and, and it really goes into quite a lot of detail. But we also offer carbon footprinting uh, calculations at product level, as well as organizational carbon footprint. Um, and further, all the other independent standards that you can you can see, and we offer this across textiles, but also across um, other um, other things like electronics um, and, and so on. So um, yeah, this is this is basically us, um, and I think we can we can continue with uh, yeah. other questions. Yeah, actually. Um just before I ask you if you have a question for us, speaker, um, I was wondering, uh, so you are part of the tool and a service that brand and suppliers can uh, use to uh, evolve and adapt, um, but uh, maybe you would like to share other, uh, your other ideas uh, to help uh, the fashion professional to improve their impact on the environment. Actually, if I share uh, the last idea, is that what, what I could give uh, as an advice is that it's a summary of what we said, all of us, is that we, when you, as a supplier, when you make your products, you, you really have to think to be aligned between, like a body, you know, you, be to, you have to be aligned between uh, what you are pr producing and what you are communicating on it, how you are certified, and what uh, what are the information that would, will, you will be able as a company to give to uh, um, to uh, to the other stakeholders. So, as far as you will be aligned between all of your all of the uh, production of your items and other production and other step in the value chain and as far as you will be aligned with uh, the communication uh, on it um, you will uh, you will be okay and you will follow the laws so this this will be my conclusion okay. at, the, at okay. the lawyer uh, do you want to add anything uh, to to the uh, to this topic uh, yeah quickly for me just a uh, few keywords that I will, as an advice, first commit, commit yourself on your sustainability journey and as fast as possible. Second one, trace. Like I said, first step is traceability. So trace whether you are in the value chain, you have to trace where it comes from, where it goes to as well. And then you have to share this information. And the third will be measure. Without measure, there is no progress. So before saying you are saving the earth or whatever, first we measure. Your, your footprint, and not only carbon, that's not the only one, there is much more out there, and there is tools, there is methodology and so on. Once you understand your footprint, then you can start to reduce it. Nobody will be neutral, nobody will be positive again. You can only reduce, but each garment we are producing are polluting. Everything you do is polluting. It's just a matter of how safe we are uh, in this planetary boundaries. That will be more or less my things. And then last key point will be then to engage. 
So commit, trace, measure, reduce, and engage. Thank you. I guess one last point for me, um, as you've mentioned, obviously um, planetary boundaries, that all this environmental legislation in Europe, in the US and everywhere else is not just happening, it's not um, just out of the blue. Obviously we do need to align to certain environmental goals and, and climate goals um, in order to be able to uh, pass on um, certain environmental benefits to other generations and, and to advert a, a climate catastrophe, right? This is the current uh, area in which we're operating. Um, so um, these green claims and legislation currently is not forbidding you from making, um, you know, um, a, a conversation around uh, your credentials, but these are there to support you to actually substantiate and test and certify and truthfully talk about um, the impact that you have um, on the world and to, to improve that. So whether or not we want to look at it as a, um, as a stressful thing or as a complex thing, but it's, it's there for the good of everyone and we need to substantiate what we're saying. So that's, that's my last point. Thank you. Um, for the brands, the most important thing is uh, to work with suppliers that they know all these subjects, they work all these subjects, and um, like Stefan said, um, it's very important to do it now and uh, not in uh, five years, I don't know, but yeah, yeah. it's very important to work now because all the brands, NAF, NAF first, uh, want only work uh, with suppliers, they know the subjects, they work the subjects, they, they, they have certification, uh, uh, they have all information, they, sh they share all this information. Thank you. It's actually, uh, I would say, the second time that we have um, an important brand. Uh, Chloe was the first to come on our roundtable. You are the second one. Uh, it's, it means something. It's very, uh, it's easy to have uh, great speakers from uh, organizations such as TUV, independent consultants. It's easy to have the, the, the speakers from the, the startups who are proposing solutions such as Redonné over there for the waste management or Fairly Made or Cliff Fashion who are really uh, putting new solutions on the market. But it's very difficult for us to uh, hear the voice uh, of the brands directly. So thank you for that. Yeah. Which pleasure. Uh, and uh, now uh, it's your turn. Would you, ha would you like to ask something to our speakers? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Wow, quite interesting. Even I missed part of it, but really enjoyed the conversation. The, I, I only have a comment, maybe not so much a question when you said doing less bad. I think we have to find a good balance between, yes, green claims need to be verified and correct, but also not always talking about less bad. I think we also have to tell what we're doing good. And I strongly believe, I mean, if I look at Nuff Nuff, you produce high quality products. And if you produce a good product, that for me, that's a positive thing. That makes also a customer happy, hopefully, that lasts long. So I think in the whole discussion, we should not beat up. I mean, of course, we all know there's tons to do, right? And overconsumption, it's a big topic. But I think if we all only talk about less bad, I think we're also missing a point of what we're doing every day. So let's find a good balance between not greenwashing, but also try to talk about, you know, why we're doing what we're doing and find a positive spin in it without, yeah, without greenwashing for sure. And the last one who's proposing that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this was more a remark than a question, but maybe you want to react? Mm, yes, I, I'm agree with you. It's um, I I don't know if all the customers um, are ready to understand all these topics, and but it's my point of view. I think um, it is the brand um, work to change things and to. Um, educate the customer to all of these topics. Just to 
to add to that, I think this is a massive paradigm shift, as you said, having a brand, second brand, committing publicly in the Agora about the things that they're going to do. I mean, this is admirable for them, but also this is a new era where like things 2026 to 2030, I'm so curious and excited to see how legislation, substantiation will change certain things in the European space and therefore in the supply chain. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Yes, please, sir. Um, thank you. Really interesting. Um, my background is in law, but not this particular area of law. Um, um, I was really curious to know uh, how are the supply chain adopting to it? Because it seems to me a very Eurocentric thinking that is being disseminated. And the, in this event, we certainly haven't had any sense of what impact or what anxiety it is causing among the supply side. And the reason it concerns me is that uh, we know that these supply chain come from with diverse uh, cultural background, economic background. Some countries and suppliers are more adept in keeping up with the changes and knowing how to comply with them. And yet there are others who are well-meaning but not necessarily sophisticated and has the capacity to rise up to that challenge. And that then will have impact in not just in the economic well-being of those directly involved, but also in the economic well-being of people uh, in those countries. So what is being done to understand and communicate with the suppliers and see what their pain points are and how they will be or potentially could be supported. Thank you. Thank you for your question. This is typically the reason why uh, we do this kind of discussion and we want to open the conversation with the suppliers from other countries. And uh, it's a very important uh, point. Uh, would you like to answer? Yeah, th thank you very much for the question because it's true that today we only spoke about the European level and the French level. Uh, mostly. But uh, you, 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 you need to know that at the international level, um, both at the UNEP level, so the, part, the, the United Nations for the Environment, and also at the UNIS level, so the United Nations for uh, the Commission of Europe, both entities um, deal with the traceability of the supply chain specifically for the footwear, uh, for the textile and footwear sector. And they started, there, there, there is a group of experts. I could give you the, uh, the link uh, later after the round table. Um, there is a group of experts which gather uh, more than once a year many, many actors from the textile and fashion industry uh, either in Geneva and Eunice and or also by Visio. And um, maybe for you it would be very interesting to be part of this uh, group because um, I this group, so it's, a, it's, it's really, um, it was, uh, it is made at an international level. So you will have um, some uh, reports of uh, what is done in Bangladesh, what is done in some other uh, country like Egypt. And uh, there are some al already some examples of uh, um, actions which are made uh, regarding the social issues and regarding also the environmental issues because both are linked. So I will give you the, the link after. Okay, um, Stefan. Yeah, on my side, uh, uh, you fully acknowledge that there is a lack of, uh, of raising awareness. First, lack of understanding, at least from the European side of it. It's quite centric, of course, because it's already very complicated. Even if other uh, countries and, and, and governments are go working to it, but we have a lack of raising awareness about this. There is multi-stakeholders, but there are quite high-level ones. And at the same time, other countries are moving. Like we saw this year, China is investing its own traceability solutions 
which is China made, so we know how it's work. Uh, and the other countries are working. We have the same issues with the SMEs in Europe because uh, we are collaborating, for example, with Euratex, which are representing the uh, uh, the industrials from Europe. And we are well, same everywhere in this uh, value chain. Ninety percent of this value chain is SMEs, more or less. So how could we uh, raise awareness first and raise capacities on this? We know we have a, a huge, huge challenge. We know it won't be that easy. We know we'll have some bar barriers that will come at the, the gate of Europe, uh, but other countries, same. You, we spoke about the US with uh, the EU, go low and so on. So uh, we are not naive on the subject. Now it's how, again, how we do it uh, on very practical way. So first, it's more call for, for brands that are, again, accountable for as they are the last point of the touch point from the market, they are the, from the demand to, to collaborate and to educate and to go together with their suppliers and industry players as well. And also with the other countries, uh, we need to talk uh, more regarding how it's going and so on. But we foresee, um, we saw that past years it was difficult in our value chain to collaborate because we are very fragmented. We are like the automotive industry. 95% uh, of their business is done by five companies worldwide, so easy. For us, it's a challenge. So it's more and more the time of collaboration between all the countries and the players that is coming. But for the moment, it's really still a challenge, to be totally honest. And it's yeah. a global and problem, so we are obliged to help yeah. all the stakeholders um, to, to evolve. Yeah, absolutely. Just to add to that, uh, at UV Rhineland, we have auditors and uh, verifiers on ground that provide training for all of these things, um, upcoming legislation and upskilling uh, or support for uh, the full supply chain in local languages. Um, and I know that we've presented quite a lot on our environmental standards, but we also certify for all the social standards. Uh, and wage standards and everything else um, within within social with our systems yeah. uh, certification. So, yeah. And I guess we are all expecting those rules to become to become the same for all any countries because automatically, if one country and admitting this country is very huge, uh, is not playing the same role internally and is able to continue to produce in the conditions that are so uh, damaging the environment and the workers and the people in the end, uh, it doesn't make any sense to change the rule as well, right? So we, we, it's about how we can uh, uh, progress all around the world and, and, wo and work with the same rules everywhere. But it's, it's really hard to, to hear this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, discourse of wh when in the past we have imposed, some countries have imposed their own rules to the whole world, right? So I understand your question, but the, top, the, the idea is really to involve all the stakeholders and to find common solutions uh, to progress, I guess. Any other question? No other questions, so would you like to say a word to conclude? Yes, um, so I guess get in touch, we can help. <laughs> <laughs> um, and substantiate whatever you want to claim environmentally. Decide to um, upskill your supply chain there are so many solutions out there. Um, the beehive solution with our chemical traceability, everything else. Um, it really needs to, to be done yesterday um, because we are in a climate emergency and certification of more environmentally beneficial topics and not necessarily only incremental, but things like chemical management, which has a massive um, impact in terms of global warming and, and carbon footprint or life cycle assessment and durability and things like that. Um, it's our duty to do something about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want to say something? Two words, mm -hmm. get in touch as well if you want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so now I, will, I think I will say the same uh, to really my, uh, my first word is alignment of, uh, with what you, what you do and uh, I think it's a, a good word to, uh, to summarize. Thank you.
Um, I think um, it's the most important thing is um, these subjects are not only for the brand or for uh, a third party uh, person, it is for all the supply chain. So uh, it's necessary to work together, uh, the suppliers, uh, the brand, uh, the consumer only, uh, also part. Thank you. And my last piece uh, of sharing will be, I already give you some keywords, but the last keywords will be more close to yours. Keep your good sense. That's the only thing that drives us. Just stick to it and then it will be fine. I'm sure. Thank you very much. Um, so we have still one presentation and uh, I would like to thank all of you. I hope it's clear to you. Uh, I know the, the, the topic is really complex and if you would like to go further, uh, feel free to, to, to come to talk with our speakers uh, after this round table. Thank you so much. <laughs>